what makes the world's best Coast Guard. It's not our cutters. It's not our aircraft. It's our people. The U.S. Coast Guard Maritime Professional. The human connection we create when we train and work alongside partners around the world. Whether it is supporting combatant commanders and protecting national interests, working with our partner nations to protect the world's oceans, defending free and open trade in the Indo-Pacific, or preserving and protecting national resources and interests in the Arctic. The U.S. Coast Guard models acceptable maritime behavior across the globe to bring stability and security. Not with a domineering spirit, but rather a cool and even-tempered perseverance in our duty. No one else can do what we do. We are the world's best Coast Guard. This thing work? Can you hear me all right? Great. Well, uh, thank you all so very much for coming. We have postponed this. Uh, I'm certain Admiral Schultz's staff thinks we've postponed it 57 times. It's not been quite that often, but certainly a lot. And I want to welcome all scholars, guests, uh, uh, to this Olmsted Lecture, something we've been doing for about six years. But before we begin, uh, I'd like to just take a moment of silence. This past week, uh, we lost two giants uh, in the defense business. Uh, just yesterday, an old boss of mine for three years, uh, General Colin Powell, passed away at Walter Reed with complications of COVID. And then less than a week earlier, an Army Chief of Staff, Ray Ordierno, at the young age of 67, passed away from, uh, it was ultimately pancreatic cancer. Uh, both were literal, uh, Ray was a giant in the Army and a giant in person a gentle giant, many tours in combat, uh, probably did more to uh, train more combat army officers than any other general in the army. And what can be said about Colin Powell? I mean, what can you say about this magnificent general? Uh, I have the honor tomorrow with another person at four o'clock, uh, I'm gonna lay a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers uh, for General Powell. Um, and uh, again, I just ask for a moment of silence for these two Great Americans, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Now, we're gonna get on with this evening event. Uh, trust me, all of you who haven't been here, there, we have more drinks and heavier poo-poos after the meal. <laughs> but you gotta listen to me a little bit going to listen to Kurt a little bit, and then we're going to be, the Commandant of the Coast Guard is going to talk about what his magnificent service does, and I've really learned so much about it, and we're so thrilled that Coast Guard officers are now part of our Olmstead team. But I need to, I'm going to put a little ad out about the Olmstead Scholar Program. What is it? How long has it been around? It's been around 63 years, 63 years. Our first Olmstead Scholar was Admiral Carl Trost. General Olmsted knew that if he didn't pick a true superstar, that perhaps the program might have a hard time getting traction. Admiral Trost was the brigade commander. He was first in his class academically, a submariner, later chief of naval operations, and a passionate, passionate believer in the Olmsted Scholar Program. He studied at Freiburg, where I studied, and uh, because of that wonderful start, the program has developed into what it is today. A uh, little background, we've selected 727 officers over 63 years. We've sent them to 218 universities in uh, 62 countries in 44 languages. And 47 Olmsted Scholars have been promoted to the rank of flag. Now, I'm not counting CEOs in business because we've got plenty of those. I'm not counting success in other efforts in life. But that's where we are. And what I tell everyone, the Olmsted Scholar Program, the Olmsted Scholar Program is a leadership development program done in a foreign language at a foreign university 
immersed with your family. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we send spouses. We send family members to language training. Uh, and we, if you already speak a language, if you speak French, we're sure as hell not going to send you to some place where you can speak French. That would be way, way too easy. Now, I've heard some great remarks um, from scholars. First of all, there's six months of the program. I'll get calls. I am the dumbest officer ever selected for this program, period. Many in language school right now feel they're the dumbest officer ever selected. But that just is a little process we go through. Uh, as our former chairman of the board used to say, Doug Crowder, he said, we give them enough language so they don't starve when they get into country, okay? And none of them have starved. None have starved. Now, my favorite expression, a young Marine, Cam Marshall, uh, who studied uh, in Zagreb, Croatia. He's in Mar 4. He's a remarkable young officer. Um, he said, and there are challenges after challenges, getting a phone, driving a car, registering, finding a place to live, passing the oral exam. All of that is so difficult. Then they're all engineers, and we make them study liberal arts. General Olmsted knew that math is math no matter where you are, but if you're going to study politics or history or in economics or law, you've got to actually learn the people and know it. And Cam Marshall said, and his advice to new Olmsted scholars is, you just have to learn to hug the cactus. And he's right. <laughs> you just have to learn to hug the cactus. And that's what our program is all about. So um, I'd like right now, uh, first of all, I'd like the members of our board of directors to stand up and so you can see them all. We, uh, we have Torkel Patterson, Bob McClure, Ambassador Christy Kenny, uh, retired Lieutenant General Pat Donahue, retired Admiral Jamie Fogo, uh, uh, Kurt Tidd, and I can't see with the face. Yeah. Anyway, a, hand, a round of applause for our board of directors. <laughs> we have a board meeting tomorrow, and uh, so we try to arrange this so the night before we have our reception, and uh, then we go into the board meeting. Um, one of my jobs, I'm introducing Admiral Tidd tonight. I was elected because we voted on what staff member had the closest haircut. I won, okay? <laughs> it's good to have a, another follically challenged uh, member of our board. Pat Donahue was close. He was a close second, but he didn't get it. But uh, when I asked, when Kurt came on as chairman after he retired from Southcom, he was the old salt in the Navy, commanded Southcom. When he was selected for Southcom command, he called me, he said, send me every Olmsted scholar who ever studied in Latin America. So his CAG was, his aide was an Olmsted scholar, the CAG was run, and Jamie Fogo did the same thing. I mean, in Europe, there's just no question that's what, that's what happened. Um, but I said, you know, Kurt said, I'll do whatever you can. And so uh, I said, one of the best things you could do is go out with your Naval Academy connections and with your great time as the old salt and the surface warfare officer, I want you to go out and recruit as many sea warriors as you can to join, to apply for the Olmsted Scholar Program. Well, I happen to have a special photo of Kurt doing his job. Could you put it up, please? Please? Ah, <laughs> uh, there we are. That's Admiral Tidd. He took it literally. Uh, I'll tell you, none of those creatures applied, Kurt. I mean, I know it was good. I did tell Kurt they, you know, their undergraduate grades weren't quite good enough, okay? But I'm, Kurt is going to have the honor of introducing our guest speaker. But uh, we have many scholars here tonight, uh, both in language training and, and who've done their program. I asked all our guests to just circulate afterwards and chat with them. My favorite quote having to deal with the Olmsted Scholar Program is from the, the Greek scholar, historian, general, and uh, later senator. He wrote Thucydides. He wrote the definitive history, eight volumes, of the Peloponnesian Wars. No one has ever read eight volumes of the Peloponnesian War, but he's famous for writing that at about 400 BC. And the quote that I love attributed to him, and it probably was actually said by Yogi Berra, but it is attributed to uh, Thucydides. He said, a society that separates its scholars 
from its warriors, will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting done by fools. The Olmsted Scholar Program is the absolute antithesis of what Thucydides saw coming. Because we take warriors, we make them scholars, they get to know the culture of foreign countries, and they bring all of that back with them. And they go drive submarines, work on Coast Guard cutters, they're Army Rangers, they're F-22 pilots. There's no utilization tour. We want them back in the force doing what they do. So that's the Olmsted Scholar Program. It's my honor now uh, to introduce my soulmate and look-alike, Admiral Kurt Tidd. Kurt. Well, thank you, Bruce. Uh, I, I, confessions right up front. I, I have his haircut, not his wit or his intellect. Uh, but thank you, Bruce. I appreciate that. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege and, a, and, a, and truly a test of patience uh, on the part of uh, the entire Coast Guard staff for me to be able to welcome our speaker. As Bruce said, uh, we have been trying to get Admiral Carl Schultz here to talk with us um, for a good two years now. And, and he has been gracious enough and his staff has been clever enough to rewicker his schedule every single time that, uh, that we tried to do this. And so it is, uh, it, 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 it's fortunate that we were able to bring this together. Um, I think I, I won't go into the details. I believe you've got in the, uh, in the brochure Admiral uh, Schultz biography. A couple of salient points I think do bear mentioning. Um, he is a member of uh, the world's finest Coast Guard. There are none finer. Uh, Bruce, you said you challenged me to recruit sea warriors. Uh, I may have failed on the Navy side, but I would argue that uh, we have had nothing but success with our, our friends in the U.S. Coast Guard and all of the scholars that you have sent us are hands down some of the most talented and well-qualified candidates that we have to try to winnow through and try to pick the one who is going to be the scholar that year. Uh, we could take easily any of the, the records that you send us, and we'd love to be able to take more. The United States Coast Guard, uh, it is the smallest of our maritime, our sea services, and really the smallest military across the United States if you just count the uniform members and the active duty military members. 41,000 only, very small. 6,200 reservists, 8,500 civilians. Uh, but the folks who really punch above the weight and add a certain amount of heft and that are near and dear to my heart are those 25,000 Coast Guard auxiliary men who are out there working side by side with, uh, with their friends on the gold side. Uh, Admiral Schultz has commanded Coast Guard cutters, the Venturous, Acacia, and the Farallon, uh, but he's also commanded at the uh, most senior levels of the Coast Guard at Coast Guard Land Area, uh, and now obviously uh, in Washington, D.C., in probably the most challenging and the least favorable um, in terms of rules of engagement environment that, uh, that any warrior could find themselves in. You knew what you were getting into. You had plenty of time in the uh, legislative affairs branch of the, of the Coast Guard. Uh, you have been adept at being able to very effectively articulate the case of, of why a Coast Guard and why this nation needs every Coast Guardsman and woman that they can bring to bear against a daunting array of challenges. But I think probably uh, the, the, the two points that I would point out is that uh, he, he really cut his teeth uh, in the toughest job, which was the J-3 job. Anybody who's ever been a J-3 in any command will understand what I mean by that. But he was the J-3 at the most active uh, of all of the uh, challenging all-mission, no-forces theaters at U.S. Southcom. Uh, and I am thankful. Uh, all of my time at Southcom, I was blessed to, to have uh, a sea service made up of white hulls with orange racing stripes, and, uh, and they were always very welcome down there. Uh, probably the, the only other thing that, uh, that Admiral Schultz and I share in common, uh, Admiral Schultz was a proud member of the class of 1983 at the Coast Guard Academy, go Bears, uh, but we are also proud parents of two new Coast Guard ensigns uh, who are members of the finest class, the class of 2021, who are out there now hitting it hard on cutters doing the mission of our nation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor, it's a privilege, but it's also just a distinct pleasure to welcome Admiral Carl Schultz, our 26th 
Commandant of the United States Coast Guard, the world's finest Coast Guard. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks, Kurt, and um, thank you for having us here tonight, Bruce. It's a, it's a real privilege. Um, distinguished guests, former Olmstead scholars, uh, just folks around town here, leaders. What a privilege for the Coast Guard to get a chance to come out here and talk to you a little bit about what we do. And I really want to focus tonight on the topic, geostrategic importance of maritime security. And, and I'll give you a little sense of what that is. But before I want to shift, I want to thank the Olmstead Foundation, because it is a big deal. You know, I wish when you went back to 65 years ago and you started to say, Carl, I said, geez, I wasn't even born back then. I hope this is not going to be my own. I wish I knew about the Olmstead program, because what a great opportunity. And uh, it was just this week. We identified four new candidates, and you guys will down select another Coast Guardsman to join, join the program. So we're very excited about that, and I think it's going to pay tremendous dividends for us. I hope as, as I talk about the Coast Guard tonight, maybe through a lens that's a little bit more international than you might think, you might see that sweet spot on why this is such a great opportunity for us. And Director Cataldo's here from our, our International Affairs, and I really love and I've challenged Ann to help us get to a second Olmsted Scholarship here as soon as we possibly can. So we're working hard on that. You know, our scholars that have gone through a program of studying Argentina, China. Well, Mike, Mike's here tonight, Mike, Mike Soyevich. Mike was in China for a while, then Mike was in about four other countries during COVID. So uh, it was kind of, instead of where's Waldo, it was like, where's Mike Masoyevich? But uh, he is back and he's on my staff, and this is sort of his de-escalation tour, not from his studies, but just from not knowing where he's gonna be living tomorrow. But uh, we've got a, a Croatian, Italian. Jamie Fogo is very helpful getting our Italian student into Italy, and Jamie, we appreciate that. And Lieutenant, Nate Matthews, who's here tonight. Nate is going to go to Norway. Nate, we're excited about that. Um, Licky Till, they tell me that is good luck, you know, break a leg. Yeah, I'm not sure, you know, what that means. I'm the son of a Norwegian mother a little bit, and I was thinking about this international crowd tonight, and this may be dangerous, but I was thinking about you. Don't buy a swimsuit, because the water only gets to 20 degrees in, in Travis or Norway. That's in the summer. It's five degrees in the winter. But you know, this, this Norwegian and this Irishman are, are competing for a job and it's at an engineering firm in Dublin. And um, the boss interviews both these gentlemen, both the Irishman and Norwegian, and they just hit it out of the park. He is very much conflicted about who to hire. It is a, a dead tie. So he goes, I'm gonna, I gotta come up with another means. So he goes, I'm gonna give him an aptitude test. So he gives both these gentlemen an aptitude test. They both score 19 out of 20. They just rock it. So he wanders off, they're kinda waiting for a decision here. He wanders off, he comes back in the room, he walks up to the, uh, to the Irishman, and he says, listen, remember they're in Dublin, he goes, I got some sad, bad news for you, but uh, on this occasion, I've decided to select the Norwegian for the job. And the Irishman is, is tremendously angered. He's, he's thinking through this, he says, you know, being the Irishman here, I would think you'd give me the job here. And he's sort of bitten a little scene to his local constituents, and uh, the boss is looking, he said, well, you know, we made the decision you know, not on the number of right answers, but, but really we focused on the answers you got wrong because both you had 19 right. And he says, well, he's just even further insult. He goes, well, we both got one wrong. And the boss goes on, calm again, as, as bosses tend to be. He says, but it's really not about how many answers you got wrong, but it's, it's the answers you gave. And at that point, the Irishman is very befuddled. He says, on question number seven, the Norwegian wrote, I don't know. On question number seven, you wrote, neither do I. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll help you with your, your material for Norway there, Nate, but, uh, you know, so hopefully, as you learn about the Coast Guard tonight, you'll take away that you won't be surprised why this Olmstead program is important to us and is going to be increasingly important, because I think I hope to leave you with a sense that, that we're a global Coast Guard. Our service, nested in Department of Homeland Security, you know, now the fifth largest service, thanks DT, you know, we don't mind. You just, just stay smaller than 41,500 the rest of my eight months and we'll be okay. Marines are getting a little nervous since we climbed up to the fifth spot. But sitting in the Department of Homeland Security is a good spot for us. It's not easy. I would tell you it's not easy budgetarily. I testified on the Hill today. But I think it's the right blend. You look at us, unique blend of diplomatic information, military, we're a federal regulatory agency, we have law enforcement authorities. We just got a bundle of unique capabilities that deploy very well under this umbrella called the Department of Homeland Security. And I don't think that those, those, those skill sets and tool sets are ne necessarily 
organic to any of the combatant commands. And as, as Kurt's J3, I think he would tell you that. The Coast Guard brings some things that you just don't get to do. And uh, I'm going to walk you around the globe a bit. But our position outside of DOD, I think, brings with it a certain independence. You know, and that independence can be at the individual unit level. Sometimes it's individual to the officer. And really, just at a single cutter, a disaggregated team, or a unit member, you really have a lot of broad swath to execute commander's intent. And I think we find that to be really the value of the Coast Guard across the globe. We're small. We don't have the size to deploy our cutters in, in large groups or, or convoys. Generally, it's a single cutter doing a mission. Jamie knows that off the African continent. And um, what we do find is, you know, we send those single off cutters to important places. So every year, we send a cutter to Antarctica. We break out the ice so you can resupply McMurdo Station down there. And, uh, the Antarctic operations at McMurdo are going through a four-year recapitalization, and that's strategically, critically important. Some of the most important science in the world is done down there. We have just started reinvigorating our ability to go out and see, you know, there's no land territory, no claims in Antarctica, so every science location down there is subject to, under international treaty inspection by other countries, but we haven't done that for 22 years. We did that two years ago for the first time. But as we build out new polar security cutters, we need to pay attention on who's down there in the Antarctic continent and what they're doing. You know, last time we went to the Italians, I think the South Koreans, the China station, but we need some eyes on in some of those locations on a pretty routine basis. But that's, you know, down in that part of the world, we send a signal cutter, a single cutter out to Oceania. We send a single cutter to the Seventh Fleet, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But it's kind of like Olmsted Scholarship. You send out, it's one person having a touch point, broadening the aperture of the folks on board. You know, just this past month, and I think they're coming back tomorrow, National Security Cutter Monroe, 418 feet, you know, surface combatant, no, no missile capability, 57-meter gun, same capability as on the uh, LCSs, but it's just operated in the Seventh Fleet, working for uh, Lung out there and working for, um, you know, the, the Seventh Fleet commander. And they've been partnering. They exercised a new MOA that was just penned with, uh, with the Taiwanese back at the end of March. That's sort of a big deal. Got a little bit under China's uh, hackles a bit on that one. They exercised with the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force, the Japanese Coast Guard. They partnered with the Philippines, both the Navy, Philippine Coast Guard, the Bureau of Fisheries, Aquatic Resources. They also um, did operations with the Malaysian Maritime Enforcement Agent, the Indonesians, Bakamla. And these are all regional naval Coast Guard Maritime Enforcement Agencies, and in one good part of 75, 90-day patrol when you look at both the transit times on both ends. They had all those touch points. And I look at that region and you think about, you know, what's the impact of that? And in addition to that, they sailed in a force uh, ship's uh, formation with the Australians. So the Australians rolled out their combatants and wanted to spend three days working with the National Security Cutters. There's a lot in that statement that I think smells of goodness in terms of the Seventh Fleet and the Indo-Pacific commander's ability to not just you know, thwart a China. It's how do you build coalitions? How do you build like-minded partners in the region in their capacity? This spring, the Hamilton sister ship, she was up, transited across the Atlantic with two fast response cutters. Hamilton's mission was to get those fast response cutters into the Med, and she was going to go on and work for the Sixth Fleet, the Fifth Fleet commanders, Bob Burke over there and, um, and Gene Black. And, and that was about the time Russia was mounting forces in April at the Ukraine border. And there was a couple warships. You can read what press you want. There was a cruiser and a DDG that was slated to go there. Then, well, they didn't make their clearances. I don't know, but we sent a warship. And it looked like a white hulled warship with a blue and orange stripe. And that sailed, circumnavigated around the, uh, around the Black Sea here, partnered with the Ukrainians, partnered with the Georgians, partnered with, um, gosh, I think we did some stuff with the Turks. The, 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 both the Georgians and the Ukrainians have excess defense Coast Guard cutters. And you talk about a success story, it's when you give a nation an excess defense article, then you bring them out and you partner with them and you do some joint interoperable stuff. To me, that looks like success. And uh, we're really excited for that opportunity. The fast response cutters that went to the region, the Africa Command, uh, Steve Townsend sent them into Tunis, Tunisia, which is sort of a growing state, a region, country of importance here. So they partnered with the Tunisians, they got down to Athens, did some work. I'd been in Greece earlier, we're trying to do an MOA with the Greek Coast Guard. And uh, there's some, just some real opportunities as the Herschel Woody Williams is in the region. I just see tremendous opportunities evolving here for the Coast Guard, probably off the African continent. But it, it's just another case where you team up a couple of these one off, in this case, a small SAG of three, one to deliver two, and you just build some capability at the end of the day. Um, 
Each year, going back to the African continent, we generally send that one ship. We'd send one ship every five to seven years. That was the battle order. Jamie petitioned us a bit and said, hey, I don't have much naval forces. Next to Kurt, Tid, and I, I thought, you know, pushing for resources in the Coast Guard was hard until I was a J-3 at Southcom. Then I felt like I was going to the desert with an empty bottle here. I'd sit in the Pentagon, and I thought I'd come back with a couple ships and planes for Kurt, and they're like, man, eh, not exactly. You know, it was the rest of the story. But the AFRICOM Theater, star for resources, and when, when Jamie came back, say, hey, we'd like to see some more Coast Guard there. We sort of leaned in. We send some disaggregated forces, deployable special forces team. We send leadettes. We send some folks to work in the command centers, but we said, we got to up our game. So we've sent a ship now each of the last couple of years. One of the ships that, that Jamie was on, the Athetis, is back in theater. She'll be taking the next two fast response cutters to Bahrain, and, and we're really excited about that. And we'll do the other things we do under the African Maritime Law Enforcement Partnership. But in the Gulf of Guinea, we transferred two former high endurance cutters. These are the 378-foot cutters built in the 60s vintage into the early 70s, but that's to the Nigerians. And we have brought the Nigerians out on board a former cutter. We do the same kind of things. How do we do joint operations in that region with the Nigerians? I was up in Newport with Mike Gilday and uh, you know, the, the senior naval staff. Stu, I think you were up there for ISS. And neither on my looks or my smarts, but a lot of people from a lot of navies and coast guards want to come talk to Schultz. And they want to talk to Schultz about what's going on in the Gulf of Guinea. They want to talk about well, the Danes have a ship there. And I'm talking to the Danish CNO, and he says, well, I got a ship there because we have mere ships that ply the waters. He goes, I don't know what I do, but I'm off the Gulf of Guinea. And I talked to the Portuguese, and I talked to a bunch of folks, and we start to see an opportunity. We say, how does a Coast Guard that has maritime law enforcement, you know, international brand recognition, I think you can start to stitch together some of those like-minded partners that are there, but they're not exactly there and fully engaged. So you know, some of them are there for anti-piracy, some of them are there because they're sort of delving into the IUUF illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing domain. But I think there's a tremendous opportunity where more presence from Coast Guard starts to stitch together those like-minded interests there. And, uh, and we're excited about that. Another place where I see some goodness, I think it's that well-placed coastie again that just has an impact. And our global, bland, our global brand is in high demand. I mean, that's really, this slide here, I think just shows you some places. There's uh, you know, operations in the Arctic. I'll walk around a little bit. This one down here, I talked about those two sets you know, the next set of fast response cutters. But that's a, a cruiser. What's that? 567 feet for my Navy colleagues. That's the flight deck. That is a cache of weapons. So those are Chinese version of Kalashnikovs. It's shoulder launch rockets. It's night scopes. But that was a takedown that the Coast Guard Advanced Interdiction Team deployed from a Navy ship did on, uh, you know, out there on the Dow in the Arabian Gulf. And you sort of do the forensics on that. That walks back to the Houthi rebels probably. I don't know specifically in that case. But we've been about three or four of those. So that's the Coast Guard high-end assaulters. They're in a rotational battle rhythm with the Expeditionary Marines and the SEALs in the theater. It just seems that the Coast Guard guys come up a lot of times when these takedowns go by because I think they've established a reputation there of, of really having the knowledge of the authorities, the ability to get on board, and really a good reputation for seizing evidence. But I think when you take down a, a cache like that, you start to think about where was that destined and what kind of uh, you know, instability, insurrection, things like that might those weapons and those kind of capabilities cost. You know, I think about maritime security really being critically important. I think many times navies talk about the difference of sea power, and that's what big navies think about, versus maritime security. And for me, you know, not every nation, not every military naval force is able to project sea power, but everyone, I think, has that desire to protect their maritime interests. So maritime security, and you sort of go back to the theme here, begins with a nation's ability to protect its sovereign rights. It begins with a nation's ability to have knowledge of what's going on in its maritime domain. And that's where we can be very helpful. That's the world of work. We work both domestically and abroad every single day. You know, transnational criminal organizations. You know, you get back to another place where the Coast Guard has been doing stuff for, you know, my 38 years in the service. But I turned the hands of time back. We, we were doing drug ops when I was on a buoy tender back in 1983. Never thought I'd be doing chasing drug guys on a 12-knot buoy tender, but we did some of that. But, um, you know, when I think about transnational criminals in the maritime domain, what do they do? They prey or leverage on a nation's inability to protect their own interests in the maritime domain. It's really about threatening the maritime security of a coastal state. Many times a coastal state with limited capacity for self-defense or self-interest. And that landscape doesn't change until those coastal states, those coastal nations build out some of that organic capability, that ability to govern their own maritime domain spaces. 
And what's left? What happens unchecked? Maritime security really undermines the economic security. It, it undermines food security. And it really threatens, when you roll that up into a broader region, it undermines regional security. I think that's a place where your United States Coast Guard can roll in there. And when you undermine regional security, you start to destabilize regional borders. And that, that's not a good place at the end of the day. So when we think about that, what does that look like? You know, so it's forward deployed mobile training teams. It's, it's international partners coming back resident in United States Coast Guard schoolhouses. It's senior level, senior key, le level, le 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 key leader engagements. And really, at the end of the day, you start to roll that up and it's about how do you help a coastal nation protect its own interests a bit. I want to talk about that exportable training a little bit. What is that individual coastie, what is it that they do, what they're doing at the end of the day? I, I turned the hands back over the course of my career. You go back to around 2000, and you, we've all heard of Plan Columbia and, you know, and Kurtz Theater down there. That's still a big part of the game is thwarting transnational crimes. But when you started that, it was about helicopters, and it was about Blackhawks and Columbia National Police, and it's a big part of that. And one dollar for every nine that the Colombians invest is what the U.S. put in the fight. But there's a piece of that, and those of you that operate on the waterfront know there's an ongoing piece. And it's a Coast Guard flag under the four-star at Southcom that leads this, this, this consortium of international partners, 16 different nations, foreign liaison officers, or 16 federal entities, 20 foreign nations that get together and do domain awareness, detection and monitoring for the entire Jayatif Joint Op area. That's the Caribbean, that's the Eastern Pacific. And, uh, and what we realize is that fight is far offshore. So you know, we push the borders out. And when you look about it, you think about what does any business owner figure out at some point? You figure out, and what do we experience here across the nation right now? What's on the news every night? You know, when you're moving cargo, you move cargo in bulk. You keep the cost down, and where do you do that? You take to the seas. You do that in large quantities at seas in efficient manners. And the cartels have figured that out. And for more than 20 years, we've worked with the Colombian forces. And they are, they are truly an evolving, capable force. I would tell you the story today is the Colombian naval forces are involved in about 65% um, in all the partner nations, rolling to almost two-thirds of all the drug interdiction really has a partner nation outcome or level of participation. That's unprecedented. That's not the case over the earlier part of my career, applying those waters down there and mowing, mowing lines looking for, you know, drug smuggling vessels. So that's an exciting story. You know, we don't send mobile training teams to Colombia anymore because they don't need it. The Colombians are exporting mobile training teams to the neighboring partners, to the Costa Ricans, to the Panamanians. A little bit of money through the Colombian Action Plan is really having tremendous dividends in terms of the region down there. They've, uh, they've wrapped up their eighth iteration of Operation Orion. That's Colombian-led, 45-day pulse operations. They pull in about 39 different countries from the hemisphere and, and some folks from Interpol and other places around the world that bring some some wherewithal to the drug fight, in 86 different agencies. And uh, in the last, not the last, but the sixth iteration, I don't have the data for the seventh, collectively they rolled up 90 metric tons of illicit narcotics destined to the Central American corridor and ultimately destined to America. You kind of do the, the, the plain language America math, that's over 200,000 pounds of drugs off our street. We, on an annual basis, the Coast Guard, and, and we take more drugs out of the system than all the federal, state, local agencies together. When we look at cocaine, it's about 400,000 plus. But the Colombians in that 45-day iteration are, are hitting it out of the park. And I think that's a, a tremendous story there. Their success is clearly our success in the hemisphere. And, uh, and I'm kind of proud of just our ability to support that, our ability to, uh, over many years of partnership, really do the capacity building. But sometimes the capacity building, and we saw you know, a really tough story unfold here in Kabul. You know, we've been decades into the post 9-11 scenario here, and you know, what does capacity build? It's tough, you know, you're in the space, you're spending millions, trillions of dollars, what does the outcomes look like? Here's a place where I think it's not the big investment, but it's that people-to-people -people investment. It's that soldier-to-soldier, sailor-to-sailor, diplomat-to-diplomat that really, I think, is built in some long-term positive outcomes. And, uh, and there's a story there that I think is worth, uh, is worth replicating. Um, we also have an advisory, sort of spiral out of that, stay in the Western Hem for a second. We have a maritime advisor in Costa Rica. Costa Rica, small country, coastal, skin in the game, both in the Pacific and the Atlantic. No military whatsoever. They got you know, law enforcement, public security minister. They've got a Coast Guard down there um, of about 550 people. And we've been working on them on their strategic plan. We've transferred them to 
Department of Defense, Excess Defense article, patrol boats just like the Ukrainians and the Georgians, and State Department, INL, bought them a third boat. But I look at what that 550 person force does down there, and uh, they'll have removed this year, I think the number's up to 71 metric tons of cocaine. And you think about that, that's a non-military force of 550 people. There's a, just a couple of anecdotes. They had a great case here recently where the S&M went out, they came up across a fishing boat, they brought it back to the pier, and uh, they did the boarding on board. They called in what they call the El Organismo de Investigación Judicial, the OIG. And the OIG officer is the judicial arm of the Costa Rican government. And collectively, they inspected the vessel, they built a case for reasonable suspicion, and ultimately found a hidden compartment. That hidden compartment had 70 bales of cocaine, 3,000 pounds worth. And, and what's really exciting about that, it was just weeks before that we had a team of law, Coast Guard lawyers down there training them on the judicial proceedings, training them on how you collect evidence. And, and here you see flash the bang in a matter of weeks really turn out to a case that just musters their, their wherewithal to want to be in that space, to want to make a difference. And what does Costa Rica economically survive on? It's tourism. So when they're getting overrun by, by drug smugglers in the east and west, their entire economy is at risk. Go back to that conversation about maritime security and holding you know, uh, partner nations, regional neighbors at risk. This is the game. This is where I think we were able to go down there. What we've done recently is we have now assigned a, a Coast Guard machinery technician to teach at their S&M Costa Rican Coast Guard Academy. So they're down there giving them skills. We've got a new maritime enforcement instructor that's gonna go down here shortly. And then we send one wrench turner, E6, and an electronic technician, E6, down. And we send them down for about three, four months. And just between a couple touch points, they keep that fleet of three boats going. They're still running 82-foot patrol boats we gave them that we decommissioned back when I was an ensign in 1983. They're the only people in the hemisphere that have the wherewithal. I got a call when I was down working for, I think it was John Kelly before Kurt down there, and my predecessor called me up. He goes, hey, Carl, everybody is telling me not to send these 110s through the excess defense article process to the Costa Ricans. They're old, they're broken, they're not going to be able to support them. He said, what do you think? I said, well, there's one country in this hemisphere to send them to. It's the Costa Ricans, boss. I said, if you send a couple folks down to help them, and INL puts a little skin in the game, because we were building, Southcom had a program building some nearshore coastal patrol vessels, and the first one's just arrived, but it's 2021. This conversation was 2014, 2015. For six years, we would have had nothing down there. I said, boss, send them to the Costa Ricans. And, and that's the, the benefit of, you know, you don't need new stuff, you don't need big dollars, but you need some persistent presence and you need that connective tissue that looks like Coast Guard, looks like you know, expedition marines that go down from Mar 4 South, and I, I think that's where, where you get a story at the end of the day. And um, you know, when I think about that, I sometimes, you know, sometimes we get the question says, you know, Commodore, what's the amount of drugs you took last year? I say, that's, that's a storyline. But when you really look at that storyline and the big scheme of storylines, you know, we're taking somewhere in the teens of percents out. It's, it's sort of equivalent to, you know, when I'm living in South Florida, you know, if there weren't some police in South Florida, people go 1,000 miles an hour on the highways down there, you know? So you got teenage drivers, you say, well, I saw a cop a couple of weeks ago, I might let my kid drive down there. You know, when you, you put cutters down there and you're trying to stop the drug, it's sort of keeping the lid on things. You're not stopping all the drugs, but you're stopping enough of it where it makes a difference in Central America in terms of instability, in terms of corruption, and hence it makes a difference here in America. You know, the deaths from drug-related violence and overdoses are gonna approach 100,000. You know, we have made a business out of watching numbers through this pandemic, but I would tell you that's a number that's exceeded motor vehicle accidents, and it's a number that, that really, at the end of the day, just speaks to great tragedy, but we sort of ignore that number. But I'll tell you, collectively, our regional partners are getting after that. And then you sort of, I mentioned IEUF fishing, international or illegal and regular unreported fishing across the globe. That's another place where, you know, what I've heard in my job as a service chief starting at ISS back in 2018, I'm up there talking about counterterrorism, I'm talking about drug interdiction, and every session in the margins, I was no less not attractive or smart back in 2018, but I had these partner nations, maritime forces, smaller globes. Hey, Emma, what do you guys think about IUF? I said, well, you know, we, we've been doing fisheries for 150 years, I believe in it. They said, no, no. What do you think about global IUF? You need to understand this. You need to get in that space. So we did a little study on that and, and pushed our, put our shoulder into it. Last year in the fall, with, uh, with Kurt, 
Kurt's successor twice removed, no, Kurt's successor um, down there, Craig Fowler, and we brought in the NOAA administrator, we brought in Department of State, we rolled out a, what we call a strategic outlook, a 10-year plan. Not that we have the wherewithal, the capacity to be the world's fish cops, but I think we have the brand recognition, we have the credibility, we understand the authorities, we can link up with non-governmental organizations and academia, and we start to have a conversation about how do you attack IEUF. We can have a conversation when the China Coast Guard is sort of the actioning arm in the Indo-Pacific, and they're using the maritime militia of fishermen, you know, we can call them out and say, that's not how the world's best Coast Guards operate. That's how thugs operate. But we can, we can get after this a bit. And I'm, I think there's some tremendous opportunities. But what I hear is, you know, this is what the world's maritime forces, this is what they want to deal with. This is what they want to get smart of. And I, I look at it as a, as a food sustainment issue. You know, 40% of the world's protein is harvested from the oceans. It's an ecological issue. They dredge for clams on the bottom of the ocean. They basically poach in coastal waters, you know, some opaqueness. Yes, they're Chinese vessels, but they're really flagged locally. Well, they're flagged locally because some deal was cut in the back room in Ghana or some deal was cut in the back room in Ecuador. They're not paying taxes. Those catches are not going to those nations. Those catches are going to transshipment vessels. They're going back to Beijing and they're contributing to one in every five fish that's in the international marketplace being harvested from illegal means. And, uh, and it's a dis competitive disadvantage for American fishermen. It's just beating down these coastal nations. We saw the, uh, the Chinese fleet, and you probably all saw it in the news. You know, you turned the hands of time back a year or so. 350 Chinese characteristic Chinese flag vessels off Ecuador in the Galapagos Marine Reserve. Pretty pristine part of the world. 9,000 miles from China. There's not a China Coast Guard cutter there making sure they're following the rules. The Ecuadorians came out to us and they said, hey, can you help us? And they, they did that because of the relationship with Jihad of South, the 20 years of partnership. We're, we're up and down with Ecuador in terms of diplomatic relations, but the, the touch point at Jihad had a conduit where their Navy could come and say, listen, we can't even find the fleet. Well, it's 350 strong, you know, they're big ships. They said, we can't find them, can you help us? So we took another one of those national security cutters with a Scan Eagle unmanned aerial system on the back, and we spent three days down there. We helped them identify a couple dozen of these vessels operating, and guess what? Their AIS positions, which is their automatic identification system, their, where they say they are, the names on the boats, the fishing numbers, it, it, isn't, it isn't what it says. The audio doesn't match the video down there. So it is illegal fishing going on. It's going on in the pristine area. You saw the, uh, the president of Ecuador was out in the Galapagos and all the trash from the Chinese fishing fleet had washed up on the beaches. So this is the kind of place where I think another opportunity where you stitch together some collaboration, some partnerships, some like-minded interests. And, uh, and I think we find ourselves kind of in the sweet spot on that. The Chinese have a distant water fleet. It depends. If you, if you sort of look at the distant water beyond the second island chain, it's probably, you know, it's probably down in the three, 4,000. If you sort of roll in how they project their fleets out to that second fleet, there's somewhere north of 14, 16,000 vessels. And there's no flag state involvement there. So it's, it's not a China bashing strategy, but at the end of the day, China is, is, a, is, is one of the worst offenders out there, and they will fish. Xi Ping is big, build bigger boats, go further across the world, and bring your catch back and put it to the market. So there's another place where just collaborative behavior, I think, gets you some, gets you some better outcomes. And then just, you see a couple pictures here of the Arctic. You know, um, being with the Danes last night, the new defense attache and Norwegians earlier in the week, we talk a lot about the Arctic. Russia just took chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Russia just took chairmanship of the Arctic Coast Guard Forum. Russia wants to turn the Arctic into a conversation about security. You know, Russia's deriving about 25% of their GDP from Arctic activities. Russia's partnering with China to push energy, LNG from Yamal down and, and petroleum products down to all the NATO nations in Europe here a little bit. So we need to pay attention to what Russia's doing in the Arctic. But who is that? You know, I think the lead federal maritime force with any persistence up there is going to be the Coast Guard. It's not much of that today. You know, we took the Healy, which is the science ship, sailed her through the Northwest Pass, just uh, left Baltimore, or excuse me, left Boston earlier in the week, and she's now in Baltimore, so we're going to get a bunch of scientists and a bunch of Washington stakeholders out there, but talk about that mission. But I will tell you, I think the Northern Sea Route, you know, the Northwest Passage, the Transpolar Route, that is, that is the changing world. Over the course of my 38-year Coast Guard career, the ice extent up there is probably diminished close to 35, 40%. They say it's about 13% a decade. But you are going to talk at open shipping lanes. What does that look like? You know, a ship that leaves Shanghai 
versus the Suez going through the northern sea route. You're not going 11 or 14 days off of that. That is an attractive economic business model. But Russia, how does Russia see that? Russia's going to be escorting them. Russia's going to be having a toll road there. Russia's going to have their way in the Arctic because there's no one with the capability to challenge Russia up there. I, I don't mean to be sort of a, a forecaster of doom, but I would tell you the next fawn ops that we look at in the coming decades, quarter century, is going to be up in the Arctic. It's going to be what is Russia doing and how are they deriving economic benefit from, uh, from nations that are seeing that, that transpolar route, that northern sea route, route to be an attractive operation. So just a place where I think we bring some street creds. But again, you don't bring a lot of street creds with one 50-year-old icebreaker called the Polar Star, because all she does is go to Antarctica every year. But in the Healy, we'll do science work. But the good news is we got bipartisan, bicameral support for three new heavy icebreakers. First one's under construction, actually not being built till probably the new calendar year down at uh, Halter Marine Incorporated. But those are going to be 460-foot, world-class, as a pod, really informed by the best engineering. And I think the conversation can be broad. Hopefully it's a conversation about maybe four to six heavy breakers and some, some medium-sized breakers. But we need to be in the Arctic, and we need to be up there on a persistent basis. We need to be in the Antarctic some portion of the year. But I think at the end of the day, you know, that's a place where it took us a good part of, a, of 10, 15 years to, to craft that narrative and then get some attention. But now, and maybe because you're in the Department of Homeland Security and it's alternative to the border, if people throw money at the Arctic, I'm not sure, but I'm okay with that, as long as we're getting some money for Arctic interests. But, uh, but that's, the, that's the place there. And then, really, just to sort of wrap it up and, and take some questions from me, I would say, I stitched this all together, and I think it is that maritime security conversation. You know, we partner with a lot of folks you wouldn't think we partner. We, had a, we collaborate with the Russians in the high latitudes. There's a maritime boundary line. When you think about how do you access that Northwest Passage, how do you access the Northern Sea Route, it's through the Bering Strait. So we have a maritime boundary line that we patrol jointly with the Russians. Sometimes we'll be out there with the cutter. The Russians will have a long-range aircraft. Sometimes it's the other way around. But we talk across that scene. There's fisheries cooperation. There's search and rescue cooperation. But then there's other issues. Big flail X, and I got a little dose of this from Senator Sullivan today in Alaska. You know, Alaskan fishermen shook down when the Russian fleet was doing a live firing exercise up there. So it, it's a little testy. They're doing some evocative, provocative things, not in violation of law, but we need to help better coordinate that. But at the end of the day, I think that part of the world is, is tremendously volatile. We have a partnership with the South Koreans, the Japanese, the Canadians. It's called North Pacific Guard. Another national security cutter is coming home later this week back to the Bay Area. She's been up there patrolling the fisheries. We used to be out there with the Chinese. But we got to that point where having a Chinese ship ride around a national security cutter that has a sensitive compartmented information so they skip on board, that just became too problematic from, uh, from relation. We're trying to recraft an MOA with China because it's not a place to not have a partnership. But we, as we were patrolling up there near Alaska waters, North Pacific, we encountered a four-ship Chinese surface action group. One was an intelligence ship, an oiler, and two combatants. You don't see a lot of the Chinese operating up off the you know, the high latitude Arctic waters there, last north, you know, West Pacific northern waters. But we encountered that ship. And the nice capability is when you're out there with a national security cutter, whether they know what we can do. And we can gather a lot of information on that. But that's another place where you start to stitch that domain awareness and you start to spit, stitch together. Um, you can get some outcomes. 25 years ago, we had a problem up there with high seas drift nets. These are the long, multi mile lines that would just rake all the sea life into these nets. And by the time they come back and haul the nets, everything that was in there was dead. The bycatch was really a, a horrific thing. And then the UN um, created sanctions on that. But working collaboratively with those partners, essentially high seas drift nets gone. We've had one or two cases in probably the last decade out there. But you can change behavior. You can change just like you can in the Southcom AOR. You can change that behavior, I think, on the globe on some of these fisheries issues. So let me sort of wrap it up and say, at the end of the day, it's a privilege to be here. We're excited to be teamed up with uh, the Olmstead Scholarship Program. We're hoping to, to grow our numbers. Um, I hope you found a few of those places you might, might not have thought about Coast Guard being relevant across the globe. And there's a lot of places we can scratch. We've got new attache in, in Australia servicing Papua New Guinea and New Zealand. We're putting an attache in Singapore this summer. We dropped an attache this past year in Copenhagen that's servicing Denmark, Greenland, and Norway. It's those one-offs that really, at the end of the day, give us a tremendous amount of connectivity. There may be one of those places on the African continent, Jamie, we're looking at, trying to figure out where that next move is. But we're building out the Ghanan, Ghanaian Coast Guard. We're building out the Philippine Coast Guard. It was about 5,000 strong less than a decade ago. 
They're at 16,000 marching to 40,000. They will eclipse the size of their Navy if they haven't already. And, uh, and, and those are partners that can come out. Right now, they're sort of near shore littoral. But you get those 378s, and they have three in the Philippines, and you get them to push out into the open oceans. Now you start to have an armada of like-minded partners. I've talked to, to the CNO, and I said, Mike, I'm not sure what that next muscle movement is, but when do we look at a national security cutter teaming with a former high endurance cutter and do something evocative around some of those disputed territories in the East and South China Sea. So I think there's some tremendous opportunities out there. And uh, I'm going to wrap it up and sort of say, I think it's an era of Coast Guards. I think the United States Coast Guard can be a really unique tool in the national toolkit about how we sort of influence difficult problems, whether it's the competition or the adversary China. You know, I, I look at the lens and the last thought is, and a little, a little of this is probably something I think I stole from Jim Mattis, but when we talked about cooperate where you can, compete where you're most. I think about, on this flat surface, I think about maybe a 180 degree arc, and I would say from zero to 150 degrees. That's that cooperate, compete range, and over here is that 30 degrees of lethality. You know, I, we're all about, we're written in those war plans, and I'm all about seeding that space to the Navy and the Joint Force, but in this 150 degrees, I think you roll up that, that military culture, the law enforcement authority, the regulatory mindset, the bias for action, the access that you might not get with a gray hole that you can get with a white hole, and it's that independence that goes with coasties that, that kind of do a lot of this in small places and they're developed over the course of their career. I think that is a tremendous tool in that kit to influence the great power competition. So I'll stop there and uh, I'm not sure if we're breaking here. Um, I'll take a few questions. Take, go, yep, okay. all right. Yeah, if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll get Thanks, questions. Roger. Okay. And I am a Red Sox fan. They told me to go five minutes and no more than that. But I think I, think I blew that. Uh, good evening, sir, for Senate Black, uh, going to Helsinki, Finland next year. Also, Finland? Merchant Marine Academy, class of 2016. Uh, my question to you, uh, so I'm interested in the Coast Guard's role in the next, uh, the next future large-scale conflict, uh, especially through the lens of the uh, EABO, Expeditionary Amphibious Base Operations, uh, seeing the previous ships kind of fall out of uh, importance and the Coast Guard's role in securing the hopeful uh, transport of goods and services to uh, the Marines out there in those uh, Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's a great question. I've talked to Gary Thomas, who's just getting ready or just stepped down here as the ACMAC and a little bit with Dave Berger, and, you know, Dave is steering the Marines in some different directions here and a very thoughtful, creative thinker. And I said, you know, Dave, I think we're heading to a place where the Coast Guard and the Marines are going to be teamed up a lot more like we were in the Second World War. I, think I said, you know, that you're looking at these small, light battalions to get to the out, out, outreaching islands in Oceania here with some ability to launch missiles. You know, you, you need a lot of gray hole movement on that, but there ain't necessarily enough gray holes to, to spread across the globe here a little bit. I said, you know, I could see some teaming. So when we send a fast response cutter, we put three in Guam to reach out, 10,000 mile expeditionary reach. We team them up sometimes with another cutter. You can ply 30, 60 days across Oceania but we've had Marines on those ships, and I think they see, hey, the Marines, we get some access. We know people in the region. There's a propensity to like the Western mindset, and there's a propensity to like human-to-human -human contact. I think human-to-human -human interaction is the alternative to checkbook diplomacy in the region. So I think, you know, where we fit in is um, probably on that continuum, not in the high-end fight. You know, where there's support, logistics, if there's military outload, if we're in a naval conflict with China, you know, here domestically, the ports, we will be keenly involved. We'll have four deployed port security units. We'll have national security cutters in the fight. We'll have four deployed squadron of fast response cutters. But writ large, I think our sweet spot is, is you know, left the bang. How do we sort of avert the conflict? And how do we build capacity and, and, and demonstrate that like-mindedness? And really, I think, how do we call out, you know, my sense, and I'm not a diplomat, is China does not like to be called out for bad behavior. When you start to expose 100 vessel fleets halfway around the world, ravaging the, the, the waters of you know, weak coastal states, and you start to put a point on that, and you do that with a credible voice, I'm not so sure you can't change behavior a lot, a lot left the bang there a little bit. So I hope that's helpful. But I, I really see some opportunities with the Marines moving forward, and I'm excited about that. And uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Other questions? <laughs> yeah, Bruce. Uh, you, you do, it's on recording. Oh, OK. Uh, if you haven't been to the Coast Guard Academy, uh, it is spectacular. It really is. And I've had the pleasure of meeting with uh, Bill Kelly and Angie and, 
and looking at those great, uh, I'm always curious why they're cadets and not midshipmen, but that's your issue, not mine. But uh, <laughs> the thing that I found most interesting is that in a class of um, the new classes, the last two classes, yeah. there are over 50% women. And we're talking diversity as we're moving forward. Can you talk about it, whether or not that's changed how you teach or what has been the effect on the academies? Because all of them are looking at greater diversity and how and much more inclusive. Yeah. And, and certainly the Coast Guard's leading. So you never want to correct the host, but since I just testified in this earlier today, my facts are pretty front and foremost in my mind. We're actually at 40, the class of 2025 that reported this summer is 40% women. It's 38% underrepresented minorities. I, I made a public statement today that, you know, we've gotten beaten down a little bit that, hey, we're not moving fast enough. I would tell you, I said, I, I went on record today, I said, we have more women and more underrepresented minorities than any of the service academies. So I think there's a success story there. You know, we would like to march towards 50%. Um, and, and women in the ranks, you know, in, in the, in the African-American population of, a, of, a, of an eligibility of 11 or 12% across the nation who could serve, we're about 5 or 6%. We've been there most of the course of my 38 years in the Coast Guard. So it's a competitive space. So we, we have a new, we have some new recruiting efforts. You know, in my watch, um, we went from investing about $600,000 on diversity and inclusion initiatives to about 12 million. And uh, Paul is our deputy comment for mission support, but he was our two-star in charge of the people elements of all the human capital. And we have been building out, we, had a, we rolled out a diverse inclusion action plan that we rolled out here uh, last summer and it's, it's 20, 125 change agents to go out and sort of have a conversation, difficult conversations, raise the DNI acumen across the service. And, and it's really, and, and I look at it, I'm kind of a simple guy. I'm a, sort of a sports metaphor guy, but I, I got a football team, you know, and uh, I got some that are in the wrong end of the field and I want to get them out of the wrong end zone towards midfield. I got some that want to go faster than we can. And, and you say, how do you move an organization on that? And we're trying to pace that and we're trying to stay out of the headlines. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff on, on how we approach that difficult problem. But I would tell you, I'm proud that we're making some headway. I think we've got um, some investment. It's, it's about buying. It's a, but what, what's going on at the academy is there's a point that I think we observe. I don't know if it's at 20%, 23%, but you get to a critical mass and then you're off to the races. Um, so I think we've got a, a good unfolding story there. And, uh, but we gotta keep working at it. We gotta go recruit places. We cut about 50% of our recruiters back in the sequestration years, and we haven't brought them all back yet. So we're 15% women in the general Coast Guard, 22, 23% officers, women. What we had was we did a holistic women's retention study back in 18, took the results in 19, and we had about a 5 to 12% gap in retention at the 15-year point. From 5, 10, 15, 20, we have closed that gap to almost exact same numbers, men and women, in about three years. And it was policies where, you know, if you're a new mom or a mom with a second child, you know, we will let you take your full 84 days of parental leave and we'll bring a reservist in. So, if, you know, we're disaggregated. We have many thousand small units, some 20 people, some 60. You're in a three day on, two day off, three day on duty section. You go away for 84 days, puts a lot of pressure on everybody else. So it's, there's a lot of just team pressure not to do things. Now you go away, some reservist gets a chance to come in, begging for some active duty time. You're getting your life in order. You're adjusting to being a, you know, your second kid, figuring out your child care. We got 10 child development centers across the whole Coast Guard. That's pretty, pretty minuscule. But we've gone from 4 million to 13 million in, in child care subsidies. We've made a commitment for active duty. About 40 to 50% of our women are married to other Coast Guardsmen. So we've guaranteed for 04 and below and 06, E6 and below co-location. So if you and I were a couple, and you had three years, I had two years, year, year two, you're sweating what's gonna happen in your life. Now we figure out up front, you're both gonna get two year orders. You get to say, you don't wanna do that, you don't have to do that. But we're trying to bring a lot more sort of personnel savvy policies, you know, things like ponytails, things like, and minor things. But we, we found, and I've been at this for a long time, we found how we measured people's body fat composition was really pretty much you know, denigrating to the women. And we've been doing it for years. And suddenly we had these sort of, you start to have these frank conversations, you realize there's a better way. So I think the academy is a bit of a place where we're trying to lead on that, and, but I think there's a good story up there. Yeah, if anybody's got an interest in coming up there, you know, Kurt's daughter was down, and this is how we kind of figured out that, you know, Kurt says, hey, my daughter's in school and she needs a little bit of an internship, and he says, he, I'd been sort of a South Florida guy when he came in there, and you know, he said, is there anything over Coast Guard? And we sent her down there, and here she is, you know, Kurt's brother was the head of chaplains, his dad was a three-star, it's a Navy family, true and true. And now Kurt's a Coast Guard Auxiliar, so we can, be, we can be pretty influential when given the chance. Be careful what you ask for, Bruce. I don't think we'll be a good couple. Are there any last ones? Go ahead. 
Is there a major Adam Cribb, uh, current scholar class, supposed to go to Lima? I'm speaking well outside my yeah. area of expertise as an A-10 pilot, but uh, as we look at what uh, both our Navy and our partner forces are doing in challenging China with their somewhat outrageous claims in the South China Sea, uh, and I've seen some stuff about how they say they're going to you know, send some ships to our coasts near Hawaii to almost do a re reverse uh, freedom of navigation. You're talking about doing counter narcotics in the Caribbean yes. or the Eastern <laughs> Pacific right now. I'd love to see it. Bring it on. You know, yeah. that, that what, would... what do you see as the Coast Guard's role in both challenging that, uh, making sure that our, you know, our coast is uh, safe and defended while also not uh, creating a potential problem and you know, conflict with them while they're trying yeah, to do I, that? I think back to my point, I think we would like to have a pragmatic dialogue with China because there's, there's common interests. I think you know, when you look at the world's worst offender of IUF, you know, if you can sort of call them out and expose that, then you can say, how do you work through International Four? How do you get the port state measures where, you know, when you land catch, you get count on that, it's transparent. I think there's opportunities there. You know, I think if it's, you know, the, China, the surface action group that was up in the, uh, you know, North Pacific. You know, clearly we paid attention to that. We, we did some collecting that. We put that into the system. We, we understand them better. Um, when China's up in the Arctic, you know, you wouldn't want to be off the Alaskan Arctic. You know, they, they call us in to uh, medevac one of their crew members. You, know, you wouldn't want to be that Chinese who had his arm broken to get on the, the Coast Guard cutter to, to do a little bit of intelligence gathering. But I think it's about, you know, we're, we're trying to be smart. We need to be present. You know, I talk about in the high latitudes, I say presence equals influence. And, you know, we don't have the capacity to do that. I think it's really across the globe there's a piece of that. Down in the South Kamea where Craig Fowler was sitting here, he would tell you, we're losing the China influence conversation every day. They come in, they buy a, a fire truck or a soccer stadium, but um, you know the Russians have some influence. As Gert knows, down there training the Peruvians. You mentioned going to Peru. You know, there's an awful lot of RT Russian too. And I visited Peru a couple of times. Boy, you, you, you don't find an American sports thing you can understand, but you can find a lot of Russian TV in English down there. And you say oh, that's kind of interesting. And uh, so I think it's the Coast Guard needs to be visibly present. And then you go back to the, the entire brief about maritime security. We're a credible voice there. You know, we're about maritime governance, maritime security, free and open seas, you know, sort of the post-World War rules-based order. I think who better to profess that than the United States Coast Guard? I think we're recognized across the globe as sort of not being antagonistic. We're just sort of out there kind of the do good nicks. We got some military capabilities, but I think folks don't necessarily see a leading with a combatant. They see a leading with a white ship, which looks to be humanitarian. So I think that's sort of the special sauce for us to to work in that space. So I think we'll be involved, yeah. Admiral, um, I want to thank you for coming this evening. Uh, we have lots of food and lots of drinks, and the Red Sox fans have been bugging me to death, so. Um, you got a score? Uh, I don't have a score, but I'm certain as soon as the gate opens. I can't thank you enough on behalf of uh, Admiral Tidd, the Board of Directors, uh, all the scholars present. One of the things I've learned about uh, our interaction with the Coast Guard is these are remarkable young officers who when they graduate, they're service ready. And that is so different from the rest of the services. I know when you go in the Air Force, you'll go to flight training for 18 months or so, or in the Army, depending, Airborne Ranger, a lot of the stuff, and then you do your basic course. The Coast Guard officers, when they graduate, like uh, Kurt's daughter, they go out to a, a job immediately, and they're very, very proud of that, as they should be. I'm proud of the fact that we have the Coast Guard in our program, and I'm equally proud that at a very young age, your Coast Guard officers are interacting with future leaders of the rest of the services. And I think that's going to play huge dividends later so. on because everyone, as we've learned tonight, the Coast Guard has a remarkable capability for the small force that influences so many people around the world. And we're just honored that uh, you're here tonight. Now, I'm going to present them with our coin. We had to change the whole damn coin because the Coast Guard, I had to add your crest on here. <laughs> Now, I'm a little this bit. This is a coin and probably a bill on the back side yeah. of it, right? I tell everyone with this coin and seven bucks, you can get a cup of Starbucks almost anywhere in the world, okay? And now we see uh, General D.T. Thompson, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Space Force. We're going to bill the Space Force for changing this coin one more time, D.T. <laughs> anyway, Admiral. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you. Very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Let's. Are you going to stay around a few moments? Absolutely. The Admiral's going to stay around for a few moments, grab him, talk to him, talk to his colleagues, and I thank all of you for coming to our Olmstead Lecture this evening. Thank you. Drinks are on us.